Good morning, Oak Bridge. Stand and worship with us.
Hey, Chuck, do me a favor. Hey, you can go ahead and take a seat, if you will, for a second. Uh, my name's Tom Novelet, and I'm one of the pastors here at Oak Bridge Community Church. And, you know, we've got such a great band, don't we? Seriously, I mean... Chuck, why don't you introduce all the band members, their name. Sure. Just give them their first name. On acoustic guitar here, Jordan. <laughs> On electric guitar, Tim. <laughs> Singing, we have Laurel. Kara. <laughs> Diana. <laughs> On bass guitar, Tim's daughter, Nao. On guitar, Nick. And on drums, Dan. Yeah, we appreciate our band so much. And some of you guys don't know, most of these people have been here with us for 16, 17, 18 years, 19 years. I mean, that's faithfulness and serving. They brought us a lot of joy. The summer new, we, we hope that uh, 18 years from now when I'm, like, like 65. Uh, <laughs> but anyway, uh, let's go to God in prayer. Father, we just thank you. We thank you for the ability to praise. To, to thank you for keys, even God. We thank you for a uh, time where we can gather together, where you are with us. You are here. Father, we praise you for that. Let's open our hearts to you today, open our minds to you, and just give this time to you. Let's sit back and just kick back and enjoy what you have to teach us and touch us with today. We love you, Father. It's in your son's name we pray. Amen. A couple quick announcements. If you're our guest today, we'd love to give you this little packet. It's called, uh, We're Glad You're Here. It's got a bunch of information in here about uh, Oak Ridge and all the ministries that go on. You can get this at the information desk, which is right outside the hallway. But also in here is a coupon that uh, is for a free t-shirt for you today and everybody that's with you. If you just take it right around the corner to the connect room, they'll give you a free t-shirt in that room for you and all your guests today. So we'd love to get a record of who you are. And if you're our guest today, we've got a couple things I wanted to tell you. First thing is we ask that you not give. We ask that this service be our gift to you, that you just sit back and uh, connect with God in, the, in whatever way he'd have you do that. If this is the place you call your home, you know where the joy boxes are at. And if you can give with a smile on your face and joy in your heart, then please give and, and we we'll trust that God will bless you accordingly. We don't have communion in this room today, but the room right behind us, right behind this wall, is a room called the Reflection Room, a beautiful room, great place to remember exactly what God has done through his son, Jesus Christ, uh, for each and every one of us. A great room to pray with people or to pray on your own, to write down prayers. And I get the privilege of reading those prayer requests every week along with other people that want to go in there and read them and share your prayer requests. So uh, you can go in that room back there today. A couple other things. We have our final edge for the season tonight. That's for middle schoolers and high schoolers. It starts at 6 o'clock. If you've got somebody in middle school or high school, uh, bring them up here. It's, even though it's the last one, they can start meeting people and find out what it's about. And then we still have sign-ups for Big Stuff Camp. This is a camp. We go down to Panama City Beach, Florida. Uh, all the times and dates are out on a, the counter. There's a sheet about it. But here's what I would tell you is it's, it's one of the most important things that myself and my wife and, and but my wife Kathy, Kathy did for our children, um, bringing them to Big Stuff Camp. Give them the, it's a gift of a week with God. So if you've got a middle schooler or a high schooler, I tell you what, it just changes their life. And if they go down fighting, say, I don't want to go down, here's my answer is you're the parent, make them go. That's the way that it is. And uh, you don't, once you put them on the bus, you don't have to deal with it, right? We'll, we'll deal with it. So you, as long as you get them on the bus, who cares after that, correct? In fact, after you put them on the bus, you can go and, and have a party, all right? Go home, do whatever you want to do. And for an extra 500 bucks, we'll take your wife. No, I'm just kidding. So, yeah, don't. I know I shouldn't have said that. In second service, no way to go now. We have baby dedication May 15th. You can sign up for that. So if you've got a kid that you want to say that you want to raise in Christ, you can go online and sign up for that. Uh, I know there's four people signed up already on that. It's a day that uh, we parents come in and they say, look, I'm, I'm going to raise my kid to know Jesus as best I can and then trust God with that as well. All right. We, I, it was a great decision you all made to be here today. And let's just one last thing. Let's give a round of applause to Oak Ridge Online, Oval. <laughs> But it's a great decision to be here, and here's why. I don't know what, if, the, if a song's going to touch you or prayer's going to help you, somebody in the foyer's going to say something, there's a book you're going to buy, your kid's going to come back and say something. I don't know what God, God's going to use. He may use the message, but here's what I know is God knows that you're here. God knows that his spirit can touch you. God knows what you need. I don't, and, and if you just open up, that's what happens. It is a great decision every week to come, no matter what age and stage of you are in life. 
So with that said, I know some of you are going through some tough things, some really tough stuff. Some uh, family members, friends are going through some health problems and you've just maybe lost somebody. I know some of the family here have had put their pets to sleep recently and just some tough times. Maybe you've got some financial stresses. What I want you to understand is God's not abandoned you. He's with you. He's for you. This life can be harsh. We know that. Jesus says, someday I will wipe away every tear. But while we're here, he says, I will do life with you. And I just wanted to remind you of that today. I want you to be encouraged by that thought that God's not punishing you. God is with you. He mourns with you. He has sorrow with you. That's who our God is. And maybe during these songs, you can understand a little bit about what they sing. That's just the truth. So I want to give you a moment to go to God in prayer. Just say, God, this is what I need. This is where I'm at. This is what somebody that I know needs. Just take a moment. Hear our prayers, Father. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Let's stand and sing this to our King. There's a grace when the heart is under fire. Another way when the walls are closed. space between where I used to be and the things that made I know I will never be alone there was another
was a wreck I remember who I was I was lost I was blind I was running out of time Sin separated The breach was far too wide But from the far side of the chasm You held me in your side so you made a way across the great divide left behind heaven's throne to build it here inside and there at the cross you paid the debt i owe broke my chains freed my soul for the first time i
God, we're so thankful today that that day you took all of our sins, you took all of our shame, and you put it on your shoulders. And it was by your blood that we now have eternal life. God, you paid a debt that there was no way we could ever pay. And God, today we praise you. We raise your name, God. We give you all the glory. We raise your name higher than any other name today, God. We love you and we thank you. It's in your name we pray. Amen. Hey, before you sit down, I'm just kidding you. <laughs> hey, we're going to, this is Major League Love Part 3. We're in the book of Romans. We're in Romans chapter 12. We'll finish chapter 12 today. Um, next week is Mother's Day. I hope you come next week. We've got free donuts and free coffee. Free about anything you want for all the moms that come next week. And uh, we've got a special message then. And then just a, a little head little heads up, then the week after Mother's Day, we jump into Romans chapter 13, and Romans chapter 13 tells us how we're supposed to respond to government. <laughs> that could, depending on which way I direct that, that could be a little controversial. We'll see. So if you want to know how God thinks that we should respond to government, good government, bad government, uh, whatever you choose, then uh, Paul talks about that. And so uh, hopefully you'll show up uh, certainly for Mother's Day next week and the week after that. Uh, quick question here. Any of you guys have any off-limit rooms in your house? You know, like a room where, like, it's the laundry room, you can't go in there. So if I went to your house and I started to say, can I just go in every room in your house? You're going to know this is the junk room we have. This is a closet. Any of you guys, just to raise a hand, you guys have a room that's off-limits? Now, am I the only, the only one like that? Seriously? I got one room downstairs that if you went in there, uh, I'd probably have to kill you. I mean, you'd, <laughs> it just is just a mess. And uh, it's just my stuff. It's a junk. Any cabinets that are like that? Like you don't want people looking through this one cabinet uh, or garage or a basement or a storage shed. If you came there, so this is the boundaries. You can't go there. Um, any of you guys um, have any things that, uh, at your house that you wouldn't want me to play with or you have somebody over to, or to mess around with? Like collectibles? Like maybe you have a doll collection or maybe you have, uh, uh, you know, some of those little tchotchkes that go on a thing or on a... On a any tools? Any of you guys don't like me playing with your tools? Raise your hand if you say, nobody messes with my tools. Okay, that'd be one. Off limits. Um, how about a certain chair? Is there a chair that you normally sit in that if you have a guest come over and they sit in your chair, there's one there? Any, any tables, glass tables or anything you don't want anybody to play with? All right. Here's the point. Uh, having boundaries is kind of a part of life for most situations. You may have a car, and you say, I don't want you to drive this car. I don't want you to take that car this place. We'd all agree that boundaries are pretty good. Yes or no? All right. This is the one category, and I may mention this in a second, but this is the one category that I believe that most of us relationally, this should be the first thing that we do is we say, here's my boundaries. Here's what we have. It's one of the first things that you do with your kids, isn't it? Your kid's playing out front. They're near the street. What happens if a ball goes in the street and your, your little four-year-old runs after the ball? Do they run after the ball again the next time? No, because you set a what? A boundary. Well, you don't go in that street. You don't play near the pool. You don't go out in the pond. You set boundaries. Is that correct? So boundaries is kind of a healthy thing. And in Major League Love, which is what we're talking about, not Minor League Love, where a lot of us are in, but Major League Love, the level where God says boundaries are critical. And uh, if you violate boundaries, then normally things should happen. This is what I was going to say. Most of the parenting mistakes that I see when I'm around parents, some of them, some of you, some of us, you just don't set boundaries for the kids and you let them do what they want to do and that causes a future problem, okay? I don't think I could say it any stronger than that. And I sometimes see it at church. Um, I sometimes see it on, on parking lot when I'm out and I, I see it almost all the time at a Walmart where there's no boundary for a kid going on. And it, it, yet you know, you're thinking to yourself, gosh, you know, have that person say please, have that person, no, they can't grab 10 of those. Isn't that right? All right, so I'm gonna read something that's very un-Jesus-like, we'd think, as Christians, we put this, kind of this label on Jesus, and the whole goal of Oak Ridge is to get us to know Jesus more. It's not about religion. If you're here today and you say, I'm looking for a religious experience, you're going to be disappointed. I'm, I'm hoping that you're, you grow with a relationship with Jesus. He loves you. He knows you. He formed you. And that's the relationship that we want you to grow. And that's the one that's the key one 
in all life. But sometimes religion gets in the way of that. We think that Jesus is a certain way. When, when we read scripture, when we uh, know something for sure, he's true to this, we lose sight of it. But here's, here's a quick story about Jesus that seems un-Jesus, but it's very Jesus. And if we understand this, we can go up to major the level of love, which is where we're going to go uh, with the rest of this chapter today. But uh, Matthew 10, 5 through 14, Jesus had just mentioned the names of all 12 apostles. So if you want to read verse 4 of chapter 10, you can see all the apostles, all the names of the apostles. And here's what we read. These 12, Jesus sent out with the following instructions. These were his apostles, which were eyewitnesses to Jesus, which were people that were with Jesus. These 12, Jesus sent out with the following instructions. Do not go among the Gentiles, that's non-Jews, or enter any town of the Samaritans. Those were people that were half Jews and half not Jews. Go rather to the lost sheep of Israel. And as you go, proclaim this message. The kingdom of heaven has come near. Heal the sick, raise the dead, cleanse those who have leprosy, drive out demons. Freely you have received, freely give. So he gives these apostles some unique powers that he had to do these things. And then in verse 9, he says, Do not get any gold or silver or copper to take with you in your belts. No bag for the journey or an extra shirt or sandals or a staff, for the worker is worth his keep. Whatever town or village you enter, search there for some worthy person and stay at their house until you leave. As you enter the home, give it your greeting. Now pause. What he's saying is, I want you to go hunt for people that are hospitable. They have the gift of hospitality, that are friendly, that are welcoming. So Jesus gives a boundary here. He says, look, I don't want you to go to anybody other than the Jewish people right now. This is early on. He says, this is it. This is the only people to go to. No Gentiles, no Samaritans, no other people you'd run into. I want you to go to the, and I want you to look for a home with this specific thing. They have to be hospitable. They have to have the, they, they have to be welcoming. So imagine if you had a home and you go, you know what? Somebody knocks on your door and you kind of open the door halfway and they say, uh, I've got something. You say, no, right away. No, I don't, whatever you're selling, no, I don't want it. Or you have that little sign on your door. You know, uh, if, you're, if you're selling something, go to the next door neighbor's house, not mine, that kind of thing. You know, or you got the dog barking or whatever there is. Uh, Jesus would have walked past you. A boundary would have said, well, if you're gonna, you know, if you're not gonna be welcoming, then that's the boundary I'm gonna walk away from. Now, it seems un-Jesus-like because you're like, well, that's kind of unfair just because a person's unwelcoming. They're not going to get uh, all the things that you promised the apostles to do in that situation. So let's pick up from there. It says, as you enter the home, give it your greeting. If the home is deserving, let your peace rest on it. If not, let your peace return to you. If anyone will not welcome you or listen to your words, then leave that home or town and shake the dust off your feet. In other words, what he makes the statement is the shake, the dusting off your feet was an Egyptian term. I mean, was a, a term where uh, basically if you did this, it's, it's kind of like going, well, you know, I'm out of here. I'm gone. Shake the dust off your feet and leave. So Jesus says, if they don't meet these boundaries, then walk away. You don't have to sit there. You don't have to do it. You don't have to. People come to church a lot and they have needs. I get that. And most of the time, uh, when we try and help people that have specific needs, we try and say, well, look, uh, we can help you in your marriage if you want to show up for these classes, if you want to read this book, if you want to speak to this person. So we give boundaries. But if you're not willing to do that, then really, I'm not willing to spend any time with you. That seems un-Jesus-like, doesn't it? It's very Jesus-like. It's because I care about the relationship. And if somebody, if there's no boundaries in a relationship, which, which Paul talks about here in a second, then uh, it leads to a lot of problems. You need to have relational boundaries. There needs to be, and, and for some of you that are in a marriage that's a little sideways, you know those boundaries were either violated or never put into place. You know that. They're not giving you space. They're saying things they shouldn't say. They're treating you a way you don't deserve. They're not giving you enough uh, intimacy. They're not speaking with you enough. You know there's boundaries that you've had that have been violated. And Major League Love says, look, setting boundaries is a healthy thing. If any of you are in a, in a bad relationship, you know the only way to restore that relationship is to set some boundaries. How about with a child? If you do this again, you will lose this. That's a boundary, yes? Good thing to do? Yes. Now, we don't like to have boundaries, but it's, so Jesus makes the statement here, look, if they don't listen to you, if they don't welcome you, 
then you leave that home or you leave that town and you shake the dust off your feet and say, okay, that's, that's healthy because I think he cares about the relationship. So I wrote boundaries are a key component of any healthy, growing, maturing relationship. If you want to have major league love, then you should know, one, what your boundaries are, two, what somebody else's boundaries are, three, what God wants our boundaries to be. Yes? Makes sense. All right. Um, so by the way, just here's a quick one for you. The Ten Commandments were given because we, God wants us to be in a relationship with him, and he wants to give us some good boundaries. Put him first. Right? Don't commit adultery. I mean, he gives, so you say, well, these are restrictive. No, they're protective. He gives you, because he's in a relationship with you, and he wants to have a relationship with you, therefore he gives you, I can't give boundaries uh, to my next door neighbor's kids. No, you won't drink Dr. Pepper at nine o'clock anymore. I can't do that, right? That they, because I'm not in a relationship with that kid. Make sense to you? So the 10 commandments, if you, if you just think about those, uh, they're just a sign of a relationship. Okay, so today we finish off Romans chapter 12, 14 through 21. And this is kind of the house rules, how we're supposed to love one another and to move up to major league love. It's such, today's teaching is so important in light of culture. Uh, and really the next, this week and the week after Mother's Day, just tremendously important in light of culture. And uh, none of these teachings, today's the tough, major league one, if you were for this, if you're for that message, uh, major league love one and major league love two were easy. They really were. Major league love three, today's message is a very very, very hard teaching to learn to apply. It is, the, it is the deepest of deep, and yet it is the thing that can set you most free if this is a category you struggle with. It is a freedom verse, but boy, it is, it, we are going to be challenged by this one today. So Romans 12, 9 through 13, before I read Romans 12, 14 through 21, which is where we're going. Romans 12, 9 through 13, where we've been. Love must be sincere. Hate what is evil. Cling to what is good. Be devoted to one another in love. Honor one another above yourselves. Never be lacking in zeal, but keep your spiritual fervor, serving the Lord. Be joyful in hope, <clears throat> patient in affliction, faithful in prayer. Share with the Lord's people who are in need and practice hospitality. Here's where we're going today. I'm going to read this, and I'm going to break this down into, I believe, six points that we can look at. So here's Romans 12, 14 through 21. This is so challenging. This is tough for some of you. Some of you will say, there's no possible way I can do this, and maybe not today, but you can. You can get here. Romans 12, 14 through 21. Paul, talking about major league love, talking about the house rules, your family rules. Romans 12, 14 through 21. Bless those who persecute you. Bless and do not curse. Rejoice with those who rejoice. Mourn with those who mourn. Live in harmony with one another. Do not be proud, but be willing to associate with people of low position. Do not be conceited. Do not repay anyone evil for evil. Be careful to do what is right in the eyes of everyone. If it is possible, as far as it depends on you, live at peace with everyone. Do not take revenge, my dear friends, but leave room for God's wrath. For it is written, it is mine to avenge. I will repay, says the Lord. On the contrary, if your enemy is hungry, feed him. If he is thirsty, give him something to drink. In doing this, you will heap burning coals on his head. Do not be overcome by evil, but overcome evil with good. Sounds tough, doesn't it? I've got some people that, how many of you guys like this phrase? Well, karma's a, I mean, right? I mean, something happens and, and you say, you know what? Uh, what comes around? And you're glad. I mean, that's, I don't think Jesus would ever say karma's a, not because it's a cuss word. I just don't think, I don't think he would say, well, what comes around? And I don't think he wants us to be like that. I think he wants us to be, transformed by the renewing of our mind. This is where Paul's going. He's talking to a church, a group of people. He says, look, here's the deal. It's a tough, tough teaching. Now, I, as I'm reading this, I'm thinking, but I had a, uh, a friend I've been trying to reach for Christ and uh, not making much headway. And when his, this is, uh, when his kid was, like in grade school, he was molested by a priest. And uh, this is not a, a statement against any other faith. This, he was molested by a priest, and he wants nothing to do with faith, religion, Jesus, God, anything to do with it. I mean, I understand where he's coming from. 
And this verse of, of telling him, bless those who persecute you, bless and do not curse, he, he's nowhere near that. Then I think about the person that's had something, you know, uh, I remember when um, my son-in-law uh, said he was going to marry my daughter, Katie. And the first thing I thought was, 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 was you better treat her well, because if you don't, I, you know, uh, I guess I, I said it earlier today, but I'll kill you. I mean, that, you know, that, that you get the point. You think that way. If you, you hurt my daughter, you know, we're, it's on. But the thought of forgiving, and, and again, by the way, he's a great son-in-law, so I, he's listening right now. I'm very thankful to God for him. But um, you get the point? So I, I get, if you're that person, that you, somebody violated you sexually, something took away a job that you needed, or somebody hurt you, I mean, your dad did something to you, or your mom, I, I walked out, I get it. But here's the point. Don't give up on this. God is bigger than your pain. He's bigger than your problem. And he wants to set you free. I mean, basically, that's what it is. He wants to set you free. And today could be the start of that. Verse 14, verse 14 was, bless those who persecute you. Bless and do not curse. Isn't it weird? He says it twice. Bless those who persecute you. Oh, and again, bless, do not curse them. So he says it twice. Uh, I want to give you a definition so he's making a statement that those who have hurt you or against you, I want you to uh, be a blessing to them. They may not know it, but I want you to be a blessing to them. And here's, here's the definition I want to give you. It's a definition of courage. And for some of you, I think it's going to go on the board. I'm not sure, but uh, here's what it says. Courage is strength that is restrained and controlled. Let me just say that again. Courage is strength that is restrained and and controlled. Sometimes the most courageous thing you can do is not say something or not do something. Amen? I mean, when you're, the, the best times in my marriage, the best love that I've done in my marriage is when I wanted to say something, I wasn't sure, or I knew I shouldn't say it, I wanted to do something, and I wasn't sure if I should, and I knew, and I didn't. That took courage. It took less courage to let it fly, to walk away, to, to uh, do what I wanted to do. Courage if you can understand right, strength that is restrained and it's controlled. That's something to pray for, no matter what your age is. You can say the courage to be restrained and controlled in that. I think that's what Jesus was. He was the most courageous person that ever walked the earth. He didn't, b- didn't back down from any situations, and yet at times he said nothing, and he certainly was restrained. So, Here's the term I'd put in your mind first when it comes to this. So bless those who per- persecute, bless and do not curse. How do we do that? Well, I have to show courage. I have to um, have a strength that restrains how I feel and that uh, controls it. And the only way to do that is to, to value a thing called meekness. In our culture today, it's not valued, but it's hugely powerful. Let me define for you. Here's what meek means, M E. E-K, enduring injury with patience and without resentment. That's what meekness is. That you take a shot and you're patient and without resentment. Some of the best teachers in the world, some of the, we have some great teachers that work with some of our special needs ministry. They are meek. They just, they show restraint, they show patience, they show kindness, and those people are the most powerful, courageous people I know. Kids respond a certain way, and they have a patience that I go, man, I wish I could have that kind of power and that kind of strength. Repeat after me. Meekness is not weakness. Meekness is not weakness. In our world, it seems that way. And I'm not talking about where you're milk toast, where people walk over you. I'm talking about where you show restraint, and you've already had proper boundaries in place, but you show restraint within those boundaries. Meekness is not weakness. Psalm 37, 11. But the meek will inherit the land and enjoy peace and prosperity. Matthew 5, 5. By the way, that psalm was written over 3,000 years ago. Matthew 5, 5. Jesus is speaking, and he's talking about people that God will bless. Jesus says, blessed are the meek, for they will inherit the earth. In other words, the meek people, those ones that endure injury with patience and without resentment, those are going to be at the top of the ladder. Those are the ones that uh, when everything sh- has shaken out, they're left. 
That's an amazing thing to want to be, isn't it? Meek. There comes a strength with that. Jesus was on the cross. Uh, he says, no man takes my life. I go there willingly. He's put on the cross. The scripture says that he was, he was spat upon. I mean, I don't know about any of you. Have you guys ever been sp- spat upon? Raise your hand if you've been, had somebody spit in your face. I have. I was at a baseball game. And the guy that I replaced, I was mocking him. And he spat on my face. I deserved it because I shouldn't have been saying what I said. But it took all I had, you know, uh, not to do anything. Because he was a friend, actually a friend that I'd made. I had made that mad, all right, how bad that was me. And uh, that's, it's a tough thing to take that. He was beaten, and was Jesus weak? Hold on, not physically. Was Jesus weak when he was on the cross, or was he strong? And yet he was meek. Meekness is not weakness. And if you want to be able to bless those who persecute you, you have to seek to say, okay, God, Give me courage to be restrained and controlled in what I say or do. Unforgiveness, which is what, if you're not meek, what it leads to, you you won't forgive somebody, is a detriment to your destiny. Some of you, some of the worst things that your parents have done to you, they've hung a millstone around your neck because you can't forgive them because uh, you don't want that. Unforgiveness is like drinking poison yourself and waiting for the other person to die. Get it? I mean, you think it's right. I'm not going to forgive them. They don't deserve it. But it's just like you drinking poison and you wait for them to die, but you're dying. This, This thing, God says, look, I know they may not deserve forgiveness. I get it but you deserve to forgive them. You deserve it. Bless those who persecute you. Bless and do not curse. Verse 15. Rejoice with those who rejoice. Mourn with those who mourn. Rejoice. I'm glad he he gave the two parallels. Rejoice with those who rejoice and mourn with those who mourn. Well, rejoice is birthday parties, celebrations, uh, graduations, um, it's, it's important that you're there for those things, right? I mean, you know, you guys know the importance of that, seeing events and so forth. So you rejoice to those. People ask me all the time, Tom, what do I say to somebody I'm going to a funeral? What do I say to somebody who's just lost? I'll give just recent examples. I was married to somebody for 52 years. What do I say to my, my, uh, my dad who was married to my mom for 52 years? What do I say? And I say, you've got to give them a gift. I say, what's the gift? I said, the gift is your presence. It's not words. There's no words. I've done funerals of people who have lost children. What do you say to a mom who buries her four-year-old? You tell me the magic words. I can't find them in scripture. All I can do is give them the, the gift of my what? All I can do is mourn with them as they mourn. Cry with them as they cry. Hold them touch them. I mean, that's, this is major league love right here. And this is sometimes where, today, I don't understand why, but God may be calling you today just to hear just one section of this scripture, just out of these uh, seven verses that we're going to read. There might be just one that God's just telling you to do. But uh, so today, uh, I would just challenge some of you. You need to give somebody the gift of your presence. You, you need to rejoice with those who rejoice and mourn with those uh, who mourn. Uh, I guess I have one little story along with this today. So I got a friend who I care about, and he's invited me to multiple things. And uh, we've been longtime friends, but you know how you get busy and like life gets in the way of that friendship and you're just not able to be with them much? So today he asked me, he says, Tom, I've got a, a, a banquet I'm going to uh, that, I, that he cherries the president of. And he says, uh, could you come and say the prayer for this, this, uh, this banquet? And uh, if he's watching right now, then don't take any of this wrong. But uh, I'm thinking, yeah, I can probably go. He asked me like a month ago, but then I forgot. Oh, gosh, it's today. And today, Oak Bridge City has a, a, uh, a church picnic at Lindenwood Park that I wanted to go to. Then it's the last edge, and I wanted to be here. And this banquet is at uh, 4.30. And, uh, 
uh, today. So I'm going to have to rush from here and go to Lindenwood Park and try and get in an hour or two and say hello, then come back home and get dressed in a suit. And I hate suits. Ah! And I got to wear a suit. And then I got to sit, and he put me at the lead table. And at my table is Jackie Smith of the, of the old football Cardinals and Johnny Rowland and five other names that are like way up here and I'm down here, right? And uh, my wife uh, didn't have anything to wear, so she broke the bank yesterday. At, you know, so you, know, so you, you get the idea. And, but you know what, man? I love this guy. And I thought, okay, God, I know I'm going to miss some of these other things, and I don't know what's right or wrong, I don't, but I'm giving the gift of my what? Presence. I'm here for him because I love you. I'm here for him. And, you know, he had sent me a note. He says, Tom, I, it may not make a difference to you, but it makes a difference to me if I can see you there. And uh, he's a great guy. So say a prayer for my prayer, all right, would you? <laughs> Verse 16. Live in harmony with one another. Do not be proud, but be willing to associate with people of low position. Do not be conceited. In other words, here's an easy thing. Love people, not position. Have you ever gone to a church where it seems like the people that mm, are the money givers or the big pushers, that they're put in a position of, you know, that you push them forward, right? That they're, they're elevated, they can get away with more things. Has it ever been like that? Or at a job or at a school or on the school board? Jesus just wasn't like that. He says, hey, look, he says, um, you can live in harmony with one another, but don't be proud. Don't think of yourself as better than other people, willing to associate with people of a lower position. Do not be conceited. That's, I say this over and over again. I believe the reason that I was allowed to pastor a church was because I was a janitor for 10 years and had absolutely no problem cleaning toilets. I think God understood. He says, you're not... You, you, you're going to try and treat people all the same no matter what position they're in because you've been there. You're not better than anybody else. And I know that. And I think we should know that too. I, I love this about Jesus. And that's what, it's so cool reading about Jesus, about having boundaries, and we'll talk about that in just a second. But listen to this, about this Paul wrote into this Christians in this area called Philippi. Philippians 2, 6 through 8. He talks about Jesus, who being in very nature God, now think about that. He talks about Jesus. Who being G God, that means, you know, like you guys come to me and uh, Mosaic Arts was here yesterday. They're showing me some great pieces that are going to be coming for sale. There are beautiful little brooches, little things that you're going to see for Mother's Day. You may want to get a couple. They're great. Imagine Jesus. He created the sun. He created the ocean. He created everything of beauty, the tulips that come up the tulip trees, everything. He, so this Jesus, who being in very nature God, did not consider equality with God something to be used to his own advantage. Rather, get this, he made himself nothing by taking the very nature of a servant, being made in human likeness, and being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself by becoming obedient, even to death, even death on a cross. Now that's, something else. So I know some of you have a great pedigree. Some of you have been really successful in this life. Some of you have raised some great kids. I mean, you would, you know, you, you should write books on parenting. But some of us others, we've swung and missed quite a few times in different areas of our life. And Jesus would come in and say, you know what? You who've struck out three or four times in a row, man, I love you. You who built this mega whatever, I love you too. All eyes should be on me though. I'm the one who loves you. That's just something to remember. That's verse 16. Verse 17 and 18. Here's a tough one. Do not repay evil for evil. Be careful to do what is right in the eyes of everyone. If it is possible, as far as it depends on you, live at peace with everyone. In other words, you need to set relational boundaries to be at peace. You need to set relational boundaries to be at peace. Some of you in your relationships, you struggle. You say there's anarchy at home. There's chaos. We have problems left and right. There's always arguments. It's because you have not either not set boundaries or you've not enforced boundaries. Remember Jesus said, shake the what? Dust off your feet. 
Well, some of you say, well, I can't really do that. I mean, it's my son, it's my mom, it's my uncle, it's my grandpa, it's my dad, or it's my spouse. Uh, but you need to go back to this boundary setting. I'll give, give a couple examples for you. I love my mom. I've told you about this before. I love my mom. <clears throat> and I tell married couples, but, you know, love isn't enough. Hold on. I love my mom, <clears throat> but I could only spend about three hours with her a week. Right. Now, what's crazy is my mom, if I brought my mom up here, if she could come down from heaven, which she's not going to come down, but if she came in, she'd say, well, you know what? I love my son, Tom, but I can only spend about two hours with him a week. That's what, and I loved her, but love wasn't, I, I need to, there, at age 20, I moved out of the house and actually got married, and it was time for me to go. I loved her, but I couldn't live with her. Right. So my mom had boundaries, and she said, these are the boundaries, and it wasn't, wasn't that problem, but the boundary with my mom was, which was a beautiful thing, because she came to the church, so I could see her at church every Sunday. I might see her a little bit more during the week, but after about three hours, uh, I was a lot like my mom, and after about three hours, we started rubbing heads like this. So the boundary was great. We're not going to meet longer than what? Three hours. And my love meter with her was always high. But it's, it was because, not that I'm a great lover, or not that she was a great lover, it's because boundaries are smart. Amen? All right, I'll give you a boundary with my dad. My dad, unbelievably, the Noblet family, Herc, uh, uh, is my brother Steve, my sister Billy Joe. we are terrible teasers, and to the point of it can be sinful, no question about it. My dad could not stand teasing. He hated it, and uh, uh, that was the rub in my mom and dad's marriage. My mom was a teaser. My dad hated it. My mom would throw shots. My dad was meek, praise to him, but he didn't, he didn't uh, push the boundaries. He should have told my mom at times, I'm going to be Crass. He should have told her, shut up. Don't ever do that. Don't ever say that to me again. Their marriage would have gone from, I believe, a solid B to higher. And it was just because of boundaries. It wasn't because, so my dad was meek. He, uh, and what I mean by meek, not weak. He was strong. He was courageous. He just wouldn't, he just wouldn't say anything back. So uh, he couldn't handle teasing. So to have a good relationship with my dad, we, we just learned really not to tease. And when we did, it, was, it wasn't good. It wasn't good at all. Uh, so you got to set relational boundaries. You want me to tell you about some of the relational boundaries with my wife? None of your business. I'm not going to say any of this. <laughs> so here's some key words. The point I'm trying to show you this is maybe God's touched your heart somewhere along this teaching. And I know it's not easy. I get it. I mean, all of you have different situations and different things. But here's the point. If you start to set some of these boundaries, if you start to understand this teaching and apply it, your, your relationships will be better. And you'll be more free. I did make this statement that I wanted just to echo again. I told you about the argument a couple weeks ago. If you weren't here, then you have to catch up with somebody else. I had one time a huge uh, blowout with my mom. Huge. And uh, I won't go back into that again, but it was only one time. She said things. I said things. We were lobbing grenades back at each other, and it was tears and yelling and anger and, and so forth. And two years later, remember, I told you I apologized. And... Uh, uh, I expected my mom to apologize back. She didn't, and she said, "Glad you should have." But as far as was up to me, I was at peace in that relationship. The, the, the weight was lifted off my back. That's what this is talking about here. Do not repay evil for evil, but be careful to do what is right in the eyes of everyone. If it is possible, as far as it depends on you, live at peace with everyone. In other words, there's some of the things that some of you know. There's some things you know you could do right now that you're, it's, you're responsible for this not the person you're telling it to. They might respond terribly, badly, not right, not the way you want, but your responsibility. And here's what I'd say. If you do what you know God's prompting you to do, you will be set free from that. Unforgiveness does not have to be a detriment to your destiny. Unforgiveness does not have to be drinking poison for yourself. It doesn't have to be that way. You can be set free here. And I, this is where Paul's saying, look, we're, we're going to be sideways at times. At times, somebody's going to do something wrong with you. And if you can do this, here's the key words. Sorry. Forgive me. You're forgiven. I didn't know. Let's agree to disagree. Those, at least three of those things are things that I've heard multiple people tell me at the end of their life. 
I wish I'd have said these words more. It would have been better. You can do that. Verse 19 and 20. Do not take revenge, my dear friends, but leave room for God's wrath. For it is written, this is in Deuteronomy 32, 35, he's quoting. For it is written, it is mine to avenge. I will repay, says the Lord. On the contrary, now he's quoting Proverbs 25. This tells us that Paul knew God's word. He's quoting Proverbs 25, 21 through 22. On the contrary, if your enemy is hungry, feed him. If he is thirsty, give him something to drink. In doing this, you will heap burning coals on his head. There used to be an Egyptian tradition that says you'd walk around in the public square with coals on your head. And it was a sign of repentance that you were, you were sorry for something. Just a tradition they, they had. So it says here, if you treat a person well that's treated you poorly, that may lead them to repentance. It might lead them to, to say, I was wrong. Sometimes it doesn't, but then the burden's not on you anymore. Now it's completely on them, and you're free. That's what this statement is. And I want to just push just a couple things before we get out of here in a moment. Vengeance is partial knowledge. Do not take revenge. That's partial knowledge. You, may have, you might have vengeance against a neighbor that did something, but you don't totally know why they did that. There may be a reason. You might have vengeance against a, a family member that said something, but you don't know what's happened in their background. Like I said, uh, you might have somebody that does something to you, but you might not know uh, totally what their reason was for it. They had just been hurt that day, right? You don't know what somebody's done. So vengeance is partial knowledge. Wrath is total knowledge. In other words, vengeance, you don't take revenge, dear friends, but leave room for wrath. That's God. See, God knows total knowledge. He knows who deserves wrath and who doesn't. You don't know that. So taking revenge could be one of the biggest mistakes you make. Leave room for God's wrath. Now, let me just say this. God's wrath will be visited on every person on this planet, every person that's ever breathed there. Either you'll get it or Jesus will get it for you. That's the two options with God's wrath. And he says, all deserve my wrath. Every one of us have gone astray. Every one of us have hurt the ones that he loves most, which is you. Every one of us has disobeyed him. Every one of us has said, I'm not going to follow this. This is what I'm going to do. We, God says, he says, I have total knowledge and we're deserving of wrath. Every one of us in this room are either going to get the wrath of God or either we're going to get the wrath of God put on Jesus. My vote for all of you, for everybody watching online, is that Jesus who came says to take your wrath from God. My vote is that you trust him, that you accept him, that you realize his ways are the better ways, that you realize humbly you're not that smart. You're not that loving. You're not going to outlove God. His ways are more loving. It's funny. Some people say, well, that's a very unloving thing of God. God is the author of love. He is the definer of love. You're not going to outlove God. God is the most loving. So when you see something where God wants you to do something that's right, we get it or Jesus gets it. Gets, gets it. On that one, our thinking should be this. It's more about our relationship with Jesus than our relationship with them. Some of you have been hurt, admittedly. All of us in this world are going to get hurt one way or the other. Isn't that right? Our thinking should be it's more about our relationship with Jesus than our relationship with them. And God forgave me through Jesus. So maybe I should cut a little slack. Do you think the world would be a little bit better? Do you think your family would be a little bit better if you had some boundaries, some truth, and extended some grace, yes or no? That's what Paul's saying. It's major league love. You can walk out of here and you go, no, I'm, they're going to get what they deserve. I'm going to give it to them. I'm not going to cut any slack. I'm, I'm going to curse them. You can do all those things. But I just don't think it's going to make life better for you. And I don't think it's going to bring down more blessings from God. Finally, verse 21. Do not be overcome by evil, but overcome ego, evil with good. And here's what I can tell you this. I just wrote this in the, in the uh, margin of my Bible this morning. Jesus is good. 
Do not be overcome by evil. We live in a tough world. It can be an evil world, right? You're not going to be overcome. You know why? Because Jesus is good. He's good. And I wrote this. He's faithful. He's trustworthy. He's full of compassion. He's the giver of wisdom. He's the bringer of love. He's closer than a friend. He's a comforter for the hurting. He's a guide to the lost. He's a victory bringer. He's kind. He's full of grace. He's the holder of of freeing truth. He's the keeper of promises. He is the Lamb of God. He is the Lion of Judah. He is the Lord of Lords. He is the King of Kings. He is the Messiah, Messiah and my Savior. He is worthy to be praised. He is worthy to be followed. He is our peace. He is our hope. He is our healing. He is our burden lifter. He is our wrath taker. And he is our freedom giver. And Jesus is good. And that's the whole point that I'd say. You don't need to fight this evil world with evil. You don't need to use the tools they use. Just give him more Jesus. Just follow Jesus more. Just ask Jesus to help you more. I'm not saying the ride is simple because the world has a way of trying to pound you down, but Jesus has a way of building you up and lifting you up. Paul says this is how we, we're going to respond as a family. In two weeks, I'm going to talk about how God says to respond in government. Do you really want to be haters? I mean, do, you really, do we really want to be uh, people of revenge? Do we want to be proud and haughty because uh, we have the right? Or do we want to be followers of Jesus? I mean, that's your question. So you can come in two weeks and you can hear what I think Paul says on it. That's the way that in this time period, I can't think of a more timely message. Next week, for those of you that are here today and under duress, next week you need to come for sure. Your mama wants you to be here. Okay, I'm telling you that right off the bat. So, God, we just come to you and we just praise you. We thank you for truth. We thank you that Major League Love, we thank you that Jesus he was at a level of love that I just thank you for God. His love wasn't conditional. It wasn't hidden. He spoke truth. He gave grace. He's never abandoned us, God. He is faithful to you. Father, I thank you that we know things about him. I, I thank you that your spirit resides in us as we trusted in you. I thank you that we can change. I thank you that we can come together and honor and worship you and come out a little different, a little wiser, a little stronger. God, help us to support one another, he says. We thank you for this bride called the church. We thank you for this place that we call Oak Bridge, God. I praise that you hear what we say, the things that we know about your son that are true for us and true about you. God, we love you and praise you. It's in Jesus' name we pray. And all God's people said, amen. Let's stand and sing there.
saw Jesus model this kind of love. He saw him model this kind of love to the very end. What did Jesus say when he was on the cross? Last words, some of his last words. Father, forgive them. He had a courage that was aligned with being meek and strong. And he paved the way. Uh, Peter saw it all the way through. And in 1 Peter 4, 8, I think it is. It says, above all, Love each other deeply. Now get this. He says, above all, love each other deeply. Another word for that is have major league love. This kind of love that we saw from Jesus because love covers a multitude of sins. Now how many of you guys in this room have hurt somebody that you love by word or by deed and you know you put a little gash on their heart, you said something you should have said, raise your hand if that's you. You know what? This love of Christ, it's bigger than that. If your marriage started off as a, a summer season and went spring and then it went fall and right now, man, it feels like it's, you know, January, cold. You start to love again this way. You're not responsible for that other person, but you start to love this way. And you see the power of that love. It can change every relational dynamic you have. And most of all, let's just say you say, well, the, the other person doesn't want it. It'll at least set you free. Amen? Amen. God, we just praise you and we thank you. We cannot wait next week till we can celebrate our moms. We thank you and praise you for that. I know it's a tough time for some of us who have lost moms. God, but I praise that you'll be here for us. I I thank you that we can come together again and hear a message of truth and uh, that, that points us closer to your son, Jesus. I pray for in two weeks, dear God, that we come together as a family and a group and we continue to jump into Romans. God, I love you and praise you. It's in Jesus' name we pray, amen. For the guests that were here today, remember to go by the information center and get this. Have a good day. Thanks for coming.